When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Getting past that cliffhanger, as you turn the page from Acts 25 to Acts 26, we get to see Paul's self-defense and his defense of the faith he held so dear. We've seen him tell his conversion story already. Well, here we get to hear it again. And this time it is before King Agrippa II. In verse 1, Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And it makes me wonder, if I was given the same opportunity, what would I say? What soul-shaping spiritual experience can I bear witness of to explain why I've been living the way I have all these years. There's something powerful there to ponder. Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. What would you say? Well, Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. So thank you for this privilege. I'm happy to answer for myself, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. So not only thank you for the opportunity, but thank you for your expertise in, in these issues. Festus had, oh, excuse me, Felix had that kind of expertise as well. He married a Jewess. He'd been here a while. Festus, no offense, <laughs> Your Honor, but you're new in the area. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you were doing your homework as quickly as you could. You got here and you immediately went up to Jerusalem. But Agrippa, you know Judaism well, and so I'm grateful to have a, a well-informed conversation partner. I actually loved Divinity School to have conversations about the restored gospel Often I was in the Bible Belt and I'd go on splits with the missionaries and I'd talk to, you know, pastors or, or other members of evangelical churches that thought they knew everything about Mormonism because they'd read something anti and said, oh, well, Mormons aren't Christians and so dismiss it from the start. Uh, or that, oh, well, Latter-day Saints don't believe in the Bible and so forget them. And again, it's just, uh, let's attach some devil words to them and then we don't have to think about it. And, and yet at Divinity School, you've got people who know religion you got people who love to learn about it and, and talk about it. And because it's grad school, they tend to have open minds. And those were fascinating conversations. Sometimes I'd be walking through the student lounge and I'd hear a few people go, Oh, there's the Mormon. Halverson, come here, come here. And, and I'd come over and like, what? And like, yeah, we were talking about this issue, this theology or this doctrine and whatever. And, and I'm Methodist. I feel this way about it. This person is Episcopalian. They feel that way about it. What, what, where do you Latter-day Saints weigh in on this? And it was so fun to have a conversation partner that, was, that had an open ear, but enough of a knowledge base that we could just run with it. It was really fun. And in some ways, Paul is sensing that with Agrippa. I'm glad you, you know these things. So will you please hear me out and hear me patiently? Don't rush to a conclusion yet. Verse 4, let me tell you my story. My manner of life from my youth which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. So we don't have to rehash that, but everybody knows it, okay? Those which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And that's exactly what he had said to the Jews earlier. I'm, I'm the, the apprentice of Gamaliel himself. I am a Jewish Jew. I am a Pharisaical Pharisee. The straightest sect there is. I, I, these are my Jewish bona fides. These are, this is my, my street cred. Do you understand what I'm talking about, Agrippa? Now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Unto which promise are twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. 
for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Several times Paul has brought up hope as the crux of the issue. Before he was talking about the hope of the resurrection, here he's talking about the hope of the Messiah. Because here I was, a Pharisee, the straightest sect, and I was banking on the coming of the Messiah. I knew the Hebrew Bible and could quote any messianic prophecy by heart. And I just wondered, when will God keep that promise? The promise made of God unto our fathers. When will the Abrahamic covenant be fulfilled? My heart had turned to the promises made to the fathers. And I wondered... I served God day and night. The whole house of Israel has been doing that for the sake of the hope God planted within us. We have been hoping for freedom ever since we were granted freedom from Egypt. But then to suffer bondage under Assyrian rule, under Babylonian rule, under Persian, under Greek, and now under Roman, we have been holding out hope that those hopes would be fulfilled someday. And it's because of the fulfillment of that hope that I'm here. Now again, that might cause some question marks because <laughs> the Romans are still in charge. You of all people know that, oh mighty king. But that's okay by me. It was okay by Pilate uh, because he came to know that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. And that's the kingdom I'm a part of. That's the kingdom I'm trying to build. You can come and be a part of it yourself. I tried to teach Felix about the faith of Christ, righteousness, temperance, judgment. I'm happy to teach you about the same things. I'm honored to bear witness of Jesus. And in Jesus' case, as I've said repeatedly before, it comes back to the resurrection. So straightest sect, Pharisee, yes, resurrection is a doctrine embraced by the Pharisees. And not only was I able to embrace that doctrine, when I came to know Jesus, I embraced its fulfillment, the first fruits of them that slept. That's what he gets at in verse 8, when he asks Agrippa, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? And incredible in our day means like amazing, astonishing, this is so cool, it's awesome. But literally, incredible, cred means belief. That's the root word for belief. And like, like credibility. And so if something is incredible, that's unbelievable. And sometimes we say that too in, in terms of awesome. It's unbelievable. But literally, that's really hard to believe. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. But for Paul, as a Pharisee growing up with belief in the resurrection, and then, like I said, seeing its fulfillment, Agrippa, let me pose the question to you. Why is that so unbelievable? When it's God that's doing it, that God should raise the dead. After all, if God can give life, why can't he restore life? If God can create, why can't he re create. I mean, even Caesar, and probably even you, King Agrippa, or you, Governor Fe uh, Festus, you seek immortality yourselves in a certain way. You almost deify the emperor and create temples and palaces to his glory. Uh, isn't Augustus Caesar trying to gain an immortality of sorts? Well, it's real immortality that I'm after. And I've seen it in the risen Lord Jesus of Nazareth. So please don't think this incredible. It's only hard to believe because it's too good to be true. But it's true. Sure enough, verse 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I thought I was doing the right thing. I was zealously defending the Jewish faith just like my accusers are doing to me. 
Okay, I, 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 I'm just like them. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities, foreign cities, that is. I, I wanted to take my show on the road and got permission to go all the way to Damascus to start dragging Christians back to Jerusalem. Since in Jerusalem, oh, we can take matters into our own hands as long as we can keep the Romans at bay. That was my plan. I wanted martyrdoms left and right. I wanted to make everyone a new Stephen. And yet... Verse 12, whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, this was broad daylight, I was not dreaming, at midday I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun. You didn't think you can turn up the light when it's high noon. Well, there was a brilliance I had never seen before. This light was shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. This is the same testimony he bore to Felix. And now he's bearing it to Agrippa. Once I saw the light from heaven, everything changed. And I pray you'll see that light from heaven and change as well. So verse 16, what did this Jesus whom I persecuted say to me? He said, rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, so things from your current present that will quickly become your past, bear witness of those things, minister about those things, but also of the things in the which I will appear unto thee. This is not my, this is your first vision, not your last. I will appear unto thee. These are things from the future, and I want you to bear witness of those once you learn them also. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's your mission, Paul. It's a mission of mercy. It's a mission to others. And in a way, it will be a, ref a reflection of your own experience. Gaining eyes to see, and ears to hear, and a heart to feel. Having light dawn upon you. Experiencing the power of God in your own life. And then go forth and make sure everyone else does too. Open their eyes. Turn them from darkness to light. Help them overcome, break out of the power of Satan. Come unto God so they can be forgiven. That's what this whole thing's for. It boils down to faith and repentance. Faith in Christ leading us to repentance, which brings in the forgiveness of sins. Thus, Jesus can sanctify us. That's what he did for Paul. That's what he'll do for Agrippa, or Festus, or Felix, or Claudius Lysias, or even Ananias, thou whited wall. You really can be washed clean if you'll just open your eyes. I love every time Paul tells his story. We see slight variations each time, which I find beautiful. Is it based on the audience? You need to hear this part. Is it based on Paul's own recollection? Oh, yes, this I need to say. People that are up in arms over the multiple accounts of the first vision, sadly, are usually up in arms over the multiple accounts of Paul's experience as well. 
Well, not all the case. If you're skeptical, not every time. If you're skeptical across the board, then yes, you, you throw them, you lump them all together as liars and deceivers. And, and Joseph Smith felt that. Yeah, you, you criticized Paul. You thought he was crazy. You've said the same thing about me. Fine. You want to put me in Paul's boat? Bring it on. Because like Paul, he knew it and he knew that God knew it and he could not deny it. And I feel the same myself. I love Joseph Smith's personal connection to Paul that he brought up at times when he was being persecuted. So remembering different things from his experience with Jesus and with the Father, totally fine. There were different audiences and different parts of the experience that he remembered. They all come together into one beautiful whole. And it's life-changing once we see the light ourselves. Well, in verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I mean, would you be? To see the veil part, the heavens open, the Lord descend? I'm not going to disobey that. And so I've been following orders ever since. How did I do it? I showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. He basically just said repent three different times. <laughs> repent and then turn to God. Remember, turn means to repent and do works meet for repentance. Show the evidence of that repentance by how you live ever after. For these causes... The Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. That's, that's the whole reason they're up in arms against me. I said before that the core of Paul's message was resurrection, and it is. But also the core of Paul's message is repentance. Because that's what he's crying. That's what, he, that's what we need to do in order to change. Once we've seen the light and have faith in Christ, then it naturally moves us towards the change of heart and the change of action that evidences it. So please turn. Men and brethren, what shall we do? You haven't even asked the question yet, but let me give you the answer. Repent. Believe. Be baptized. Receive the Holy Ghost. The doctrine of Christ is being offered to even you. Will you take it? In some ways, it's ingenious of Paul to emphasize those two aspects of resurrection and repentance because they're, they're so similar. You remember when we studied Acts chapter 9 and saw the repentance of Paul, but then ended the chapter with the, well, resurrection of sorts, the raising of Tabitha. And we talked about that those are juxtaposed because it's the same story. That repentance is a newness of life. It is a resurrection before the resurrection. And so to testify of those things hand in hand, Paul continues his testimony in verse 22. Having therefore obtained help, of God. I continue unto this day. And it's been over a decade since that happened. I have been continuing, obeying, serving, testifying, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. You see, I'm, I'm still a Jew of the strictest sect. I'm still honoring the law because I've seen its fulfillment I'm bearing witness of that. And here's my witness, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Both Jew and Gentile alike are being invited into that light. This is what he had taught earlier, that I believe in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. I recognize the fulfillment of its messianic prophecies. Jesus was not disqualified by the crucifixion. If anything, that's what qualified him. Because in succumbing to death, he could then conquer death, not only for himself, but for us all. That's what I've been bearing witness of. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus was all part of the Father's plan and the Father's promise to our Father's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, none of the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant could come without the resurrection. Without Christ's power over sin and death, then what's the point of a promised land or pro prosperity and posterity? What's the purpose of priesthood and the blessings that it entails? We can't receive any of those 
at least not permanently. So yes, this is the message. This is the inheritance that I am trying to pass forward. And then, verse 24, As he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, he's kind of speaking out of turn since he's been outranked. Agrippa is in town. But Festus speaks up loudly, wanting everyone to hear. Paul, thou art beside thyself. How much learning doth make thee mad. And that's what Joseph Smith brought up. That people accused Paul of being crazy. Well, they're accusing me of the same kind of insanity. I do wonder, though, if Festus is almost trying to make up an excuse for Paul. I'm not going to say that you're lying. I'm just going to say that you're crazy. Uh, non compos mentis, I believe, is the, the Latin term. That you're not mentally capable. This is the insanity plea. I mean, it's a court case after all. And maybe Festus is trying to come to the rescue of Paul. Like, this sounds crazy to me. Somebody dying and then rising from the dead. And then, yeah, okay. Okay, Paul. Sure. Uh, Agrippa, we should probably, I, I don't know if we should waste Caesar's time with this. But let's, maybe this is what Festus was, or what Felix was thinking. We'll keep him in a nice house arrest. It's like, let's commit him to the, to the asylum but we'll take care of him, and we can have visiting hours, and anybody who wants to come can. But Paul, you're crazy. All this learning. Yeah, you spent a little too much time in Athens. And all that philosophizing has kind of fried your brain. There's no way this stuff it could be true. But in self-defense, Paul says, I am not mad, most noble Festus. And that most noble might be Paul giving Festus the benefit of the doubt, for what Festus had done to give Paul the benefit of the doubt. Thank you for calling into question my sanity in hopes of getting me off the hook. But mm, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not insane, and I'm not going to use an insanity plea to get out of things. I'm here for a purpose, and my purpose will lead me to Rome. So I'm in complete control of my own thoughts. I am not mad most noble Festus. But speak forth the words of truth and soberness, and soberness suggests that, that sanity as well. Remember back in the day of Pentecost when they accused Peter of being drunk? And that's why they're babbling these crazy things, and it sounds like foreign languages. And he's like, what are you talking about? It's like 9 a.m. Nobody's drunk here. We're all sober. And Paul is preaching words of truth and soberness. And then he points to the king's own knowledge of, of Judaism, and these kinds of issues. He says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. That is such a powerful phrase. This was not done in a corner. We're not trying to keep this out of the light of day. If anything, we're trying to bring it out into the light. We want the world to see so we're not keeping it in a corner. We are going to the four corners of the earth, trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know this, Agrippa. How can you not? So it's not just the Jewish things that you're aware of. It's the Christian things that you're coming to know. This movement is moving fast, and it's on everybody's radar. There are Jews and Gentiles streaming into the kingdom Everywhere we go, I have been on not one, not two, but three missions all across Israel and Syria and into Cilicia and Asia Minor and beyond into Macedonia and down into Greece, the island of Cyprus, you name it. I've, I've probably been there or somewhere close. These things are not done in a corner. And the world can bear witness of the effect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> this moment actually reminds me of the great scene that Elder Packer talked about, where he was being sent by Harold B. Lee on a very difficult assignment, and it was daunting to him. He asked President Lee for advice, and President's, President Lee's advice was classic. He just said to an overwhelmed Boyd K. Packer, just remember it isn't 1830 anymore, and there aren't just six of us. <laughs> I love that. This kingdom is rolling forth across the earth. And by the millions, there are Latter-day Saints far and wide living the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
This thing, the restoration, is not done in a corner. And so have some confidence, Elder Packer. And he did. There are much more than six of us, that's for sure. Verse 27, Paul then asks the pointed question, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? And then he answers it before Agrippa even has time to. I know that thou believest. Agrippa had some Jewish roots as well. And so I do believe that you believe. In fact, I know you do. And then Agrippa, finally speaking for himself, said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Oh, you are so close. I, I do know so much of what you're saying. I have heard about these things. And yes, these are words of truth. These are words of soberness. I, I can't help but be convinced by them to a point. It's just getting past that point. It's like Apollos. You know in part, but don't you want to know in full? And Agrippa is almost there. To which Paul says, Oh, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. An amazing statement, kind of closing arguments on Paul's part. Oh, Agrippa, you're so close. I wish you were more than close. I wish you were all the way there. I wish you were just like me because I used to be just like you. I was almost persuaded. Well, I was <laughs> persuaded that I had the truth in Judaism. And Judaism is almost Christianity as far as Paul is concerned. It is, Christ it is Judaism. It's Judaism fulfilled. And I became almost and then altogether convinced when I saw that light. And ah, I wish you would follow the same path. I wish you were like me. Not just you, but everyone here. I wish you were all just like me. Not the bonds. <laughs> I don't want you to have physical bonds, but I recognize your spiritual ones. And I came out of mine. The Savior delivered me. He's trying to deliver you. If you would only become not only almost persuaded, but all together convinced and converted that Jesus is the Christ. He is the just one. He is the Holy One of Israel, the living Lord, the conqueror of sin and death, the light of the world. Do you see him? Years ago, when Cecil B. DeMille made the movie The Ten Commandments, the famous one with Charlton Heston, he wanted to test it on a reli very religious audience. And where better to go to find one than Salt Lake City, Utah? And so this amazing Hollywood director wanted to premiere the movie in Salt Lake, or at least preview it among the saints, to get a sense of how, do religious, how would religious people feel. Does Charlton Heston really look like Moses? I think so. Uh, the, the great Latter-day Saint painter Arnold Freeberg was the, the costume designer. So he already had some connections with Latter-day Saints through Freeberg. And, and so he came to Salt Lake and sh showed the movie, and everybody loved it. And he ended up becoming a close friend of David O. McKay, president of the church, the real modern Moses. Uh, if he were a younger man, he should have cast him <laughs> rather than Charlton Heston. But uh, Cecil B. DeMille spoke at BYU in a big devotional. I mean, he became a, a great friend of the Latter-day Saints. And the, and the saints, including the saint-in-chief, President McKay, befriended him. At one point, Cecil B. DeMille said to David O. McKay, knowing his <laughs> book of Acts, chapter 26, he said to President McKay, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Latter-day Saint. Oh, being here, knowing... The, the goodness of the saints, seeing the evidence of your faith, meeting a man who claims to be a modern Moses, a living prophet. And who am I to deny him? He does not seem crazy. He seems to preach words of truth and soberness. And, oh, there's a few things holding me back, but man, <laughs> President McKay, I'm this close. 
I love that story. I would love it even more if he were more than an almost, if he were an altogether. And which will we be? Have I almost repented or am I altogether repenting? Do I almost have faith in Christ or am I altogether converted to his gospel? Am I almost temple worthy or am I altogether ready to enter the house of the Lord? Almost served a mission or altogether ready to dive in and make a difference? In any aspect of your discipleship, ponder those terms and see in which direction you're heading. Almost or all together. And then the court case ends, as does this chapter, verse 30. When he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with him. And when they were gone aside, so out of the hearing of the crowd, they talked between themselves, saying, this man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. It's like, this guy's obviously innocent. He's done nothing wrong. I'm, I'm, not, I'm almost a Christian, but I'm altogether convinced of this Christian's innocence. Okay? He's done nothing worthy of death or even bonds. We've, we've held him under house arrest far too long as it is. And then said Agrippa unto Festus, so one leader to another, this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. There almost seems to be regret on his part. Oh, if only he hadn't called out parlay. We could have handled things ourselves and we could have pronounced him innocent. And who cares what the, the Jewish mob is clamoring for back home in Jerusalem? No, innocent man. But we have to, we have to honor his wishes. Which, to be honest, is fine with Paul. Can you picture him kind of <laughs> wandering over to that side of the room and there they are trying to get behind closed doors or just out of, the, out of earshot of the multitude and he's kind of leaning over and they're whispering like, this guy is totally innocent. And Paul's like, yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, just zip the lip. If only he hadn't said, I appeal to Caesar, we could let him go right now. And you picture Paul going, but I, but I want to go to Caesar. Oh, yeah, I, sorry, I'll stop interrupting. But do you get a sense? This is where I'm destined to go. Jesus told me that. And the same one that called me back from Damascus is urging me forward toward, toward Rome. We're not going to call this the fourth mission, but in some ways it is one. It is his journey to Rome. And that is what we see in chapter 27 and chapter 28. And it's exactly what Paul wanted. He set his face steadfastly. He was trying to get there. It's been years I've been chomping at the bit, trying to get out of Caesarea so I can go see Caesar himself. So chapter 27 opens with this voyage underway. It's a fascinating story here, especially once you see past the literal and into the symbolic. So let's put those glasses on and try to see some application and some relevance in our own journeys toward whatever destiny the Lord would have in mind. Chapter 27, verse 1, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, and Paul has never been that far west. Greece was as far to the west as he had gone. He crossed the Aegean, but he never passed the Adriatic. So are we really going, finally, all the way to Italy? Well, yes. But when it was determined that they would, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. So yes, he's in charge of his hundred men, but of Augustus's band? Wow, he must be an important centurion. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, fun word to say, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, and one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. Now this doesn't sound like they're treating Paul like a political prisoner. Do they know of Paul's innocence as well? This sounds a lot like Joseph of Egypt, who quickly gets on the good side of Potiphar, and then the jailer, and then Pharaoh himself. And so here you have this centurion, this leader, Paul, I know you're under arrest and we're taking you back to, to Caesar himself, but 
Uh, you're at liberty to do whatever you need to do. And if you need to stop here and go see your friends, then be my guest. Just get back on board as soon as possible. Uh, to refresh himself. I do love that thought too. That Paul, I'm set on, on Rome. Ah, but how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Is he feeling some of that? I will not be moved, but is his heart beating a little faster the closer he gets? To his final destination, to be able to go and be refreshed in the company of friends is so important for anyone who is facing something difficult. And that describes Paul to a T. So verse 8, when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. We couldn't go up over it, we had to go under it. All these contrary winds, there's something that's Oh, it, make, it makes it seem easier to go back and, and not fulfill the mission that the Lord has in store for me. But no, we'll just find another way around it. We're going one way or another. They sail under Cyprus. Who cares if the winds are contrary? When we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy. And he put us therein. I mean, it's going the rest of the way, so let's put you on that boat instead. And when we had sailed slowly, many days, and scarce were come over against Sinidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete, over against Salmone, and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now, don't worry so much about the names of all these places. Again, there's no map quiz at the end of the lesson. But think about the details of how long it's taking and how slowly they're going. Sailed slowly, many days. The winds were contrary. The winds were not suffering us, hardly passing by. Does that describe life sometimes? And I'm trying to do what's right, and I'm trying to go where God sends me. I know He wants me in Rome. If that's the case, then what's, where's the help? This is like the Jaredite cruise, which was no pleasure cruise. It was not the love boat. This was mountain waves dashing upon them and swallowed up in the depths of the sea and storm and wind and yet the wind blowing them where they needed to go. Just not as easily as they might have expected. This is the Latter-day Saint pioneers that it was not just a stroll in the park to get to, to the Salt Lake Valley. These are the handcart pioneers, the, the Lord of Weather, and they were banking, the Willie and Martin handcart companies at least, were banking on a light and late winter, and instead got an early and hard one. Wow. The Lord really does want to stretch us, doesn't He? He does want us to prove to ourselves how badly we really want to get to Rome after all. And what are we willing to sacrifice and how much are we willing to suffer on the way? Just because the wind seems contrary doesn't mean you're going in the wrong direction. It might be evidence that you're going in the right direction. But God is serious about you building muscles. So he's adding on the weight. Okay? Keep that in mind. As they wait here in a place that's called Fair Havens. And that at least is promising. And are there times in, as we're swimming upstream or going against the wind that we finally find a fair haven? It's like the Sabbath day, a ah, time of rest. A place where we can be refreshed with the fellowship of other saints. There they are at fair havens. And verse 9 comes. Now, when much time was spent... And so it's taking forever, and why can't we go? And when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. So it, it is not wise for us to continue at this point. We need to stay here in fair havens. And there are times when prophets tell us to march forward and times where, he, where the prophets tell us to hold back. 
Times when the Liahona says go and times when the Liahona says stop. Times when the Spirit pushes us forward and times it reins us in and tells us not to preach, right? Paul had that experience earlier in Asia Minor. And so now we need to stay here. Because the time is spent and it's dangerous to sail at this point of the year. When it says the fast was now already passed, the fast is most likely referring to the Jewish Day of Atonement, which was a day of fasting and prayer, of mourning, of repentance, atonement, right? Good, good symbol for all of this. It's a fall festival, and in the fall and winter, that's when the storms really pick up in that part of the Mediterranean. And the sailors, those ancient sailors, knew it well. And so would not sail during that time period. And they would kind of hunker down and find a fair haven to stay in. And that's exactly what Paul is recommending. I wonder sometimes, let's switch the metaphor a little bit, and think about our own journeys and at times where it's hard because, it, because we are going in the wrong direction. And does the prophet ever tell us, can you stop what you're doing and stay here and try to get your bearings. Look up through the, the darkness and find the North Star and redirect yourself. Repent of your sins. Because right now the time is, has been spent on lesser things and you've got to change your ways. When it says the sailing is now dangerous, if you keep going forward on this path, it's a path to self-destruction especially if the fast is past. Times of worship and repentance. The Day of Atonement. No, I'm not saying we ever pass the Day of Atonement. Every day is covered by the Atonement of Jesus Christ. But to get to a point in our own minds where we start wondering, am I beyond the redeeming reach of Jesus Christ? Is the Day of Atonement behind me? If so, then you better believe sailing is now dangerous and the time is, is far spent. Now hold on to your faith in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins, just like Paul has been preaching over and over. But please listen to him. At this point, what's he saying to do? Stop. Stop where you are. Stay here in fair havens and wait. How, let patience have her perfect work. Let time do some healing and some changing. There's still a journey ahead. Don't you worry. The time is not past. You're not past the atonement. But right now, let's take stock of where we are and make some real changes. Now, the question is, will they trust the prophet? Will they follow the prophet? Will they accept the urging of Paul? Well, verse 11 answers that question. Nevertheless, so despite his recommendations to the contrary, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. So that's the first problem. And again, liken this to yourself. Try to find some application. Who do we trust? I mean, the prophet tells us to stay here. And here I am, the centurion. I've got to make a decision what we're going to do. I'm in charge here. I have my own agency. And the prophet's pulling me in one direction, but the master and owner of the ship is pulling me in the other. Now be careful, because uh, the master and owner of the ship, probably, those, two, those probably have all the reason in the world to want to move forward. Because I don't get paid for having my ship stay in port. I get paid for delivering goods and cargo and prisoners, and then I can pick up another load and keep on going. Sitting around at fair havens, this does me no good. And sadly, who does the centurion believe? He believes the master. He believes the owner more than he believes Paul. And that's not the only thing. Next verse, and because of the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attend to Fennis and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. Now, you see what they're feeling here? I mean, they call it fair havens, but it's not that fair. It's kind of like Greenland. <laughs> it's, 
That doesn't seem very green to me. It seems more like Iceland. Here, fair havens? No, it's not, I love this phrase, it's not commodious to winter in. It's kind of like that, it's not convenient to do what's right right now. And because it's not commodious, it's not as fair as they think, and there's a fairer haven later on. And if we can just go there, and it's not just the master now, and it's not just the owner now, it's the more part of the people. Because they don't want us to be stuck in an incommodious port. Let's move on. Let's go. Because if by any means, I mean, there's a chance, but hey, let's take the risk. And let's move forward. Because we know what it's going to be like if we're stuck here. We don't want it. So Paul, what you're asking of us is not something that we want. To follow a prophet in this situation would be inconvenient. The standards that they are setting for us are not commodious to winter in. And especially when the more part, it's not just the celebrities, it's not just the masters and owners, it's the more part, it's the general population. And if public opinion is pulling us in one direction, who am I to listen to a prophet that's trying to lead me in the other? Now, there are so many interesting things about this story that feel so relevant in our own day. And who will I listen to? And am I aiming for convenience? Or am I willing to winter in a place that the prophet has told me is safe? It really is fair. Stay in the haven. Well, centurion, you've still got this choice to make. What are you going to do? Verse 13, when the south wind blew softly. Oh, see, there's no storm to worry about. It's all fine. It's, it's going to be great. It, the if by any means, it's happening. By all means, let's go. So as the wind blows softly, lulling them into this sense of security. Can you picture the soft wind rocking the boat back and forth like a cradle? Little lullaby. It's all going to be fine. Do what you want. Ignore the prophet. Reject the apostles. Life's good. You can be happy. But as the wind blows softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, you see, where it's all good, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. You see, we're not going to wander far. We'll stay within sight of the land. If anything happens, we can just rush on back. It'll be fine. We're gonna, it's, I'm not trying to to tear you away from the faith. I'm not trying to completely reject the prophet. I'm just, I'll keep him in sight. Uh, but we're going to do things our way. And everything seems to be pointing towards our purpose. It's, it's fine. The prophet's just overreacting. Where nothing could possibly happen to us. But next verse. But not long after. And sure enough, it usually doesn't take long for the consequences to come. Not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind. And that's no longer the softly blowing wind we saw a verse ago. No, it's tempestuous. It's called Eurocliden. I don't know if I pronounce that anywhere near the right way, but this word combines the Greek word for east wind and another word that either means north wind. Here comes these winds coming to clash. No wonder it's tempestuous. Or perhaps another word meaning surging waves. And that sounds like a typhoon. That sounds like a hurricane going on. Tempestuous wind. Oh, that's what falls and winters are known for in this part of the Mediterranean. What were we thinking? That we'd get out of it somehow? Well, when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. I mean, we had no choice. We had lost control of this. And holding on to the rudder wasn't doing us any good. We couldn't, we'd lost control of our lives and we just let it drive and running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat and by the boat, we mean the lifeboat, not the ship itself. We have no control over that, but even trying to hold on to some kind of little lifeline, something we could jump into, at least a few of us and try to preserve our lives. No, it takes so much work even to hold on to that because we've lost control. I thought 
I could handle things. When the prophet warned me about the word of wisdom, oh, I thought a little alcohol here or a little tobacco there or an occasional recreational drug. And yet now I find myself, my, find myself in the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. I find myself in addiction, needing help to find recovery. That's the world that my wife and son work in. And to see the much work that it takes to hold on to some kind of lifeboat, and many of them won't even hold on to that because they just let it drive. They're caught, and they can't bear up, and their life is no longer their own. That can be true of breaking the law of chastity. It can be true of any time we disregard the prophet because the south wind is blowing softly. Because the standards they're requiring are incommodious. Because the master and the owner and the more part of the people are promising us easier ways. Oh, it was only easy for a time. That's what the prodigal son learned. And it wasn't until he hit rock bottom that he came to himself. Well, this ship, is it about to hit rock bottom? Because there's no coming back from, from that kind of a shipwreck. What's going to happen? Verse 17, which when they had taken up, so they hoisted up the lifeboat. They used helps, better word there would be ropes, undergirding the ship. Now, this is really wild to picture this. What, what they're doing is they're taking these ropes and, and passing them underneath the, the bow of the ship, getting it down around the hull, so in hopes that somehow these additional ropes will help hold the planks of the ship together. I mean, that would make me really nervous if I saw that happening on a cruise. Like, what are you doing with all those ropes? Uh, don't, don't ask. Uh, but here we are trying to keep the ship from falling apart beneath us. Yeah, tempestuous wind, I'd say so. Now, fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, and a better translation for that would be sandbars, but waters too shallow to sail in. Afraid of that, they strake sail, and so were driven. What they mean by that is they threw out the anchor, hoping to slow down their drift. Now, let's, let's strike the sail. Get that down. We, want, we don't want to be blown about by this tempestuous wind. Let's throw out the anchors and hopes it will just slow us down as we're drifting toward these sandbars. Because if we fall upon them and it, it can break the hull of our ship to the point that no number of ropes would help hold it together. Even that's not going to be enough. And so the next verse, we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. So things that we were holding on to because we thought they might come in handy later on. More ropes to, to tie the boat together. But no, anything weighing us down has got to go. Even the tackling of the ship. And so they throw it overboard. And keep going. When neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. This is the end of the path when we've disregarded the prophet's voice. We will be looking for lifeboats and finding none. We'll be trying our best to just hold it all together. And yet will the ropes hold your planks from falling apart? Quicksand, sandbars. But I do like the King James translation because I think of quicksands being something that just swallows us up and we start sinking into it. And sometimes the more we struggle against it, the faster we sink, and we're just looking for someone to throw us a lifeline. Is there anyone there to help? Or have they abandoned ship and abandoned us? We have no more tackling. There's nothing left. At desperate times, here I am, and what am I going to do? I've met people at that stage of their departure. This is the prodigal son hitting rock bottom. And where do I go from here? Have I lost sight of the sun and the stars? Am I, do I find myself in, in total darkness? 
And have I lost all hope to ever be saved? I am fascinated by Acts chapter 27. So often we skip over it as mere history that Paul gets to Rome and he gets shipwrecked on the way. But to pause at, with every passage to, to see the phrases and the words and apply them and see, I've been on that boat. Maybe I still am. And we've had a prophet that's already warned us about all of these things. And why didn't I listen? In verse 21, after long abstinence, this is Paul biting his tongue, forbearing to say, I told you so. But now he can't hold it. After long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. Again, I'm not trying to rub salt into the wound, but I told you this from the very beginning. I have told you this before, to borrow the Savior's language. And you didn't hearken. Why didn't you listen? And now it's on you to have gained this harm and loss. You got exactly what you asked for, exactly what I warned you about. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, I told you so, and then every man for himself. He's not jumping in the lifeboat and saying, I'm the only one that deserves it. No. Like a Moses willing to still suffer with the people, like a Nephi pleading for Laman and Lemuel to stay with the rest of the family, like a Levi Savage telling the handcart pioneers, then I'll stay and suffer right alongside you. What does Paul say? Now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. And I'm sure they would have preferred not to have those last four words, but, oh, you mean the ship is going to be sunk? Yes. That is unsalvageable. You were using it to go in the wrong direction, so we're just going <laughs> to cut bait. We're just going to end the connection with the whole thing, and we're going to have to find some new way of getting to where we need to go. The old way is not working. So, yes, the ship will be destroyed. But that, that's just a temporal thing. Sometimes we are afraid to repent because of the things we stand to lose. Not realizing that what we stand to lose if we don't repent is worth infinitely more. So let the temporal thing go. Get rid of whatever you paid for those negative influences. Cut off, and sometimes it'll even require you severing old relationships, friendships. The prodigal son lost all the so-called friends he'd made there in the far country. All those books of the curious arts, <laughs> worth 50,000 pieces of silver. They let those go too. Forget the ship. Who cares? Spiritually speaking, I can survive this. Repentance assures us of that. If we'll start listening to the prophet, if we'll start hearkening to their words, if we'll begin the change, then who cares about the ship? You will survive the experience. And that's what Paul is promising. But how does he know? How, well, how did he know that it wasn't wise to, to keep sailing? And how does he know that we're going to survive? Verse 23 he tells them, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. This angel and I <laughs> work for the same master. And this angel reassured me, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. So yeah, we're gonna oh, we're gonna crash land. We are going to barely survive this experience, but we will survive it. God Himself promised me that. And not only did He promise me, He promised you through me. That's a really interesting phrase. God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. It's almost this package deal that God holds on to his prophets. I've got the prophets back because the prophets got my back. 
Uh, I will not leave you comfortless. I will be there with you every step of the way. Paul has received that kind of reassurance from the Lord multiple times through his missions. And he knows he's got to get to, see, to, to Rome. He knows that he has to be there. So we know he's going to get there. And so I know I'm going to survive this shipwreck somehow. This storm will not drag me down. But again, he's not jumping in the lifeboat with an every man for himself kind of, a, kind of an approach. What about the people? What about everyone else here? Both fellow prisoners, because there's some others going to Rome that are guilty, as well as my captors. I care about them too. This is like him with the jailer back during that earthquake. I don't want him to take his own life. I don't want these to lose their own life. And it's amazing to me that the Lord reassures the prophet by saying, if they'll trust in you, then that's the next best thing to trusting in me. And as long as they're with you, then, you're, then they're with me and I'll save you all. It makes me want to be a follower of prophets and apostles of God. It makes me want to stay with them. So the, the, the same Lord who looks after them will look after me. And there's even this sense in Paul's language. I, I absolutely, my favorite line in all of chapter 27 is what he says to the, to the crowds crowding about him. With fear in their eyes and, and wind uh, blowing their hair about and everything drenched under the, the water of these the waves and the splash and the storm. And this is an intense moment. And you picture Paul yelling out over the sounds of the, of the surf and the, and the storm. Sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God. You see what he didn't say? You believe God and you need to hold on to that and tr trust in him. No, it's just trust in me and I trust in God. And my connection to God will be enough for you as long as you're with me. I'm not asking you to believe. I'm asking you to trust in my belief. That, there's something profound there. It makes me wonder, is it enough? Well, actually, I know it is enough. Uh, this is Doctrine and Covenants 46. One gift of the Spirit is to know that it's all true. But another gift is to believe on their words. It's like, I don't know for myself, but if you know, then I'll hold on to you. And I trust that you're holding on to God. This is what Elder Holland has said before. If you're struggling in your faith, then please hold on to mine. Lean on my testimony for a while until you get your own again. That was kind of him. That's him saying to us, be of good cheer, for I believe God. And I wonder, for all of us who are worrying about loved ones who have left the faith, wayward children, prodigal sons and daughters, or husbands and wives or parents, we all seem to know somebody who's tossed in a storm at sea. And we just want them to believe. But until that moment, our belief might be enough to the point that not only can we try to cheer them up, but we can cheer up ourselves because I believe in a God who I serve, whose I am. And he will care not only for me, but he'll care for the people I care about. I've said to people before that as long as you hold to the iron rod firmly with one hand, then you can hold to others compassionately with the other. And as long as you don't get pulled apart, and as long as you don't let go of either one, then that, way, that wayward saint, that struggling soul, will never be too far away from the path that leads to the tree of life. Hold on. But especially hold on to your faith. As long as I believe, then those that I love aren't too far from belief. And maybe they will trust in my trust and have faith in my faith until they can gain faith of their own. 
this is a profound moment and I think we need to settle it into our hearts and inscribe it on the fleshy tables of our souls that the world can be of good cheer because we believe. From there, where does the journey take us? Verse 27, when the 14th night was come. Wait, Paul, didn't you promise it was going to get better, that we were going to be okay? Well, yeah, it's been two weeks now. I know. Wait. Sometimes the promise is slow in coming, but it always comes. I do wonder, though, are they running out of rations? Do they, are they worrying about how long this is going to go? Do they still trust Paul? And does Paul still trust God? Well, we know the answer to that question. Anyway, after these 14, the 14th night has come and gone, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, so here's our moment of greatest darkness, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. They couldn't even see it. Remember, they hadn't seen sun and stars in days. But they're getting a sense, I wonder if we're getting close to some country. Could they hear something, the sound of the crash on the, on the rocks? I don't know. But as they're wondering this, they sounded. They tried to get a sense of how deep the water is. They found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Okay, so the water is getting shallower. We are getting closer and closer to land. Now, is this going to be quicksands? Is this a sandbar? Is this going to be crashed up against the rocks? Are we approaching our death or our deliverance? I don't know. But Paul believes and I'll trust in him. Now, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, so that is a concern. They cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Have you ever had such a dark night that you just wished for the day? Have you ever tried as hard as you can to stop where you're going and you just hope that there you have enough anchors out there to keep you from crashing against the the rocks of consequence. Hey, this is an intense moment in darkness, but praying for the light to come. Verse 30, And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, so these are not the passengers, this is the crew. These are people who know the ship and the sea and the storm better than anyone. This is like Peter and James and John on their own boat with Jesus saying, Carest thou not that we perish? And they're the ones freaking out, thinking they're going to die. These shipmen, we did the sounding. It's getting shallow. We're about to crash against the rocks. We, it's every man for himself, not the captain going down to the ship anymore. Forget that. The shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat into the sea. Under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. Now stop there, think what they're doing. They're getting into the lifeboat and trying not to alarm the rest of the passengers. They're pretending to be going to the bow to be able to let down some more anchors. You remember the four they already let out? Those were from the stern, the back of the boat. So it's like, don't worry, we, we still trust Paul. You should too. We're just going to get in this lifeboat. But it's not really a lifeboat here. It's just a, a chance for us to be able to move forward toward the, the bow of the boat where we're going to cast out some additional anchors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we're doing. There, those, when it says under color as though, that just means they're faking it. They're pretending to be, we're doing something to help save us all. When really what they're doing is trying to save themselves at the expense of everyone still on the ship. Well, Paul sees through that, and notice what he says. He said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. And fully trusting Paul's warning, then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Now this is a bold moment. Can you picture it in your mind? The sailors are ready to set sail themselves, to just cut and run. And Paul sees it, knows it, and tells the soldiers, the centurion and others, if these guys leave, we're all going to die. We are all in this thing together. And we will, we will live or die all as one. Now, the soldiers and centurion by now fully trust Paul. 
to the point. And plus, it's like, what, you're going you're gonna to go leave? Forget that. We really are all in this thing together. So they cut the ropes that connect the lifeboat. And the lifeboat floats away. There's no other option. We're sticking together. And we're staying on this boat. Now, with that in mind, again, hold to the analogy that we've been trying to develop. The symbolism here of following prophets and apostles. If Paul says, stay on the boat, that's what we do. There was actually a talk from Elder Holland given years ago called Abide With Me. Oh, those beautiful verses from John 15 about the true vine and staying connected to him. Well, Elder Holland shifts the metaphor from John 15 to what we now see as Acts 27 because he talks about a ship. He calls it the good ship Zion. And you better believe that the apostles and prophets are there at the helm. Well, actually, the Lord's at the helm. <laughs> but these are the sailors aboard. Here we are, the passengers, but this is what Elder Holland said about it. When we join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we board the good ship Zion and sail with her wherever she goes until she comes into that millennial port. We stay in the boat, he said, through squalls and stills, through storms and sunburns, because that is the only way to the promised land. My friends, do you remember when Cortez came to the New World and many of his men still had one foot back in the old world and didn't want to fully commend themselves to this new life because they, they missed the old. It was more commodious to winter in. It was more comfortable and convenient. And so what did Cortez do? He destroyed his ships. And all of a sudden, the men were highly motivated to make the new world work. That's what Paul's demanding here. And that's what the soldiers are ensuring here. No more lifeboats. There's no other option. We will stay in the good ship and go wherever it takes us. Do we have the same level of belief? Do we trust in the Lord and his servants? Or do we at least trust in their trust? They believe we can be of good cheer. So verse 33, While the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. I'm trying to keep you alive here, okay? And I don't know, however much longer we have to stay, it's not going to be long. We can start eating again. We don't have to ration the food. So eat up. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. So Paul is here leading by example. He's showing his own faith by his works. He's putting his money where his mouth is, or at least his food where his mouth is. <laughs> He's eating, breaking a fast that was kind of a forced fast because we don't have any idea if we'll ever get to land again. And if we're just stuck out here in a lifeboat or on a sinking ship, will we have food to survive until somebody finds us? And good luck anybody finding us because it's the winter and most people are smart enough not to sail. Well, Paul is telling them, the famine is over. Here's the bread of life. Here's the meat, which is for him to do the will of his Father in heaven. Eat up, and he's eating himself. Now, verse 36, then were they all of good cheer. It's amazing what, what a little food will do to you when you're hungry. They also took some meat, and we were in all in the ship, 200 threescore and 16 souls. Wow, 276 people. That's a lot of people, which means a lot of food. But they'd been storing it, stockpiling it, waiting, and now it's time to eat. Now, eating it, though, suggests, I guess we must be close to deliverance. Otherwise, it doesn't do us much good to be eating the food that we should be rationing. Well, it's even beyond just the food they're eating. Notice what happens next. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship. Now, they'd already done that before. They cast out the tackling. They cast out anything that was unnecessary. But food was necessary. Not anymore, though. They lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. They trusted they wouldn't need it any longer. They trusted that God would provide. Oh, Paul's influence is bearing fruit. And sure enough, when it was day, 
So now we have light instead of darkness. Man, it's been a while since we've seen sun or stars. Now we finally see sun. The storm is over. But still, they knew not the land. But that no longer mattered to them. At least there's land ahead. Oh, they were willing to move forward in faith. They're going to venture into the unknown. It's better than the storm at sea we've been on. So come what may, let's go to land. And as they're trying to find their way to some safe harbor, they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. Now, it's one thing to think of some deep river, uh, and if we can just steer in there, then we'll have something deep enough for the ship. That's not quite what they're seeing. Creek with a shore elsewhere is translated a bay with a beach. And if it's a beach, what they're looking, what they're hoping for is just to run aground, if that's possible. That's the phrase they use, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. It's not a matter of docking. It's a matter of crash landing on a sandy beach. So hopefully we can at least get off the boat and get on shore. If it's a deserted island, well, it's better than drowning at sea. We'll figure something out. I mean, Paul's with us, which means God is too. Now that's the plan, if we can get to that kind of a place. And in verse 40, when they had taken up the anchors, and the Greek actually suggests that they cut the ropes and left the anchors in the sea. So it's not taking them up into the ship so we can use them again if we choose to. It's like, nope, we really are commending ourselves to God. So cut the ropes of the lifeboat, already did that. Now cut the ropes to the anchors. Okay, here goes nothing. They committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. At least they hoped that's where the wind would blow them. I mean, these sailors now are leaving themselves totally at the mercy of the elements, or I should say, the God of the elements. They are commending their own lives to God. We're not even going to hold the rudder anymore. We loosed the rudder bands. We put the sail back up so that the master of storm and sea and wind and water can do whatever he wants with us. We hope that it's bringing us to some sandy shore, but we trust God come what may. Now, sure enough, falling into a place where two seas met, and some translations render that a sandbar or a shoal or a reef, they ran the ship aground, and the four parts stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So they made it, but just barely. Uh, they're going to survive, but I hope you ran to the front of the ship, believing where you were going, instead of hanging out the back, longing for the old world you left behind. Now, if you're all in on this, then come aground to the promised land. The good ship Zion got you there, and now that you're here, there's no need for it which is fascinating if we want to push our analogy still further. The church is meant to be a ship. It's not meant to be our final destination. But it gets us there. Elder Maxwell and President Lee and President Ballard have all talked about the church as scaffolding. And when the scaffolding has served its purpose and built the actual building, then you can take the scaffolding down. We're still building the kingdom of God. We need the church to help us construct it. The day will come, Elder Maxwell said this beautifully, where the church will come down like so much scaffolding, leaving the eternal family, I would even say God's eternal family, in place. That's the superstructure we're, we're trying to edify. But in the meantime, thank heaven for the scaffolding. In the meantime, thank heaven for the boat. Stay on board Will we make it? Yes. Will we barely make it? Sometimes I wonder. Uh, but even if the good ship Zion crash lands on the shores of the celestial kingdom, we barely made it to the millennium, but we're here. The Lord will be there with arms outstretched. I've been waiting for you. Now, what happens here? This four part of the ship there, unmovable, it's a great word. 
It sounds unshaken to me. It sounds immovable. I'm here on, on land and I'll never leave it. Verse 42, the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. Like, wait, no, no, what, wait, what, seriously? You, you're like, they survived the, the storm, they survived the shipwreck, and now you're going to kill them just because they had some troubled past? No. Don't worry about that, the centurion says. It says that the centurion willing to save Paul. So again, here's someone who has risen in the estimation of his captor, another Joseph of Egypt figure. Willing to save Paul, the centurion kept the soldiers from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. We're right here. I mean, the front of the ship is already stuck into the, the sandbar itself. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land, just as Paul had promised. Now, we're still not in Rome, but we're getting closer. We'll see when we turn to chapter 28 what island they happened to crash land upon. But from there, it's just a matter of finding another ship and getting to our ultimate destination. There, Paul's rendezvous in Rome and his chance to bear witness before Caesar of all the things that he'd been bearing witness of all along. For that, we get to our final chapter this week. And our final chapter of the book of Acts I'm sad to see it go, to be honest. I wish we had more stories. I wish there was an Acts of every apostle, each, an individ each individual one, and see all of Paul's missions and all of John's missions. James's was cut short. But what about Matthew? What about the good Judas? What about... Bartholomew and Philip and everybody else, I, I wish we could learn more. Instead, we end here with Paul, and we don't even get to see the end of his story. Luke kind of leaves us with another cliffhanger of sorts, as if to suggest, oh, there's much more to this story. I can't keep writing, but you can keep pondering. In fact, you can keep more than reading, you can write more stories of your own. You can pick up where the apostles left off. Not just in Rome, but anywhere in the world you might be. Continue to preach their message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's going to do here for us. And then pass the baton to us. And so, Acts chapter 28, verse 1. When they were escaped, and escape's a good word. Uh, other translations say, when they were safely on shore... But if you've ever gotten out of addiction, if you've escaped the consequences of your sin, then escaped is the right word to use here. And sure enough, these people had all escaped. Then they knew that the island was called Melita. We call it Malta. And there it is, south of Italy. We're getting really close. And the barbarous people, and that sounds pretty harsh. The Greek word just means foreigners. They didn't speak Latin. They didn't speak Greek. But they did speak the language of human kindness. And so they do. The barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. It is winter, after all. And the storm hasn't completely abated. It's still raining, but these kind barbarians. And that's kind of funny to me anyway. It seems that Paul is safer among barbarians than he is among either Romans or Jews. No wonder he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. It's the outsiders that seem to be more open than the insiders are. And they're treating them kindly. Verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, he's just trying to help, and he's probably just as cold as everybody, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. This animal's cold-blooded, and it's cold, and it's rainy. Does it kind of stiffen, look like a snake, and it just got picked up with the rest of the bundle? And then as it's thrown into the fire, it, ooh, that, that'll get a cold-blooded animal more than <laughs> warm-blooded ever could. And jumps out and, and sinks, its fang, sinks its fangs into Paul's hand. It fastened on his hand. It's not going anywhere. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer. 
whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Ah, yeah, that's got to be it. I mean, by their fruits ye shall know them. And now we're seeing some fruits. He's being cursed by God. He got out of the storm, but he's not getting away from the serpent. There it is, still hanging from the man's hand. Well, what does Paul do? He shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while, can you picture this? They're just kind of sitting there, wise, eyes wide, like, okay, when's it going to happen? Well, okay, fine. He got rid of the serpent, but the venom's still in there. Surely he's going to start swelling up. And can you picture them staring at his hand or his forearm? Whatever hand got latched onto by this poisonous snake. They're looking at his legs to see if they're starting to get wobbly. Surely he's going he's to slump over any second. But when it doesn't happen, when they saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> it sounded a lot like Acts chapter 14. Remember that story? When there's all this persecution and you're evil and we're going to destroy you. And then Paul and Barnabas heal the lame man. And they're like, never mind. This is Jupiter and Mercurius. Come down among us. And Paul's like, make up your mind, people. Are you going to persecute or praise? <laughs> is it war or worship? Wh wh which one? Because we're, we're neither the, the devil nor the God you've made us out to be. We're somewhere in the middle. Just mere mortals but bearing witness of the God of all of us. Interesting that these barbarians would swing from one pole to the other, but no need. Paul's no God, but he knows God. And it's a God who had already promised his servants that no poisonous serpent would cause them harm. And Paul trusted in that. Be of good cheer, I believe. Then verse 7, In the same quarters or in that same area of the island, were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius. And possessions, others' translations render an estate that belonged to the island's chief official. Okay, So, nice place to live. It's where he's the guy in charge stays. And this man, Publius, received us and lodged us three days courteously. So he's no barbarian himself. In fact, he's as nice as those nice barbarians were, courteously keeping them under his roof. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, which is dysentery. This is a pretty nasty disease, and he's really suffering. To whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. I mean, when it's the father of the, the guy in charge, yeah, the, the word's going to spread fast. And they all came running like, there's a, a guy here that can heal people? Well, I'm next in line. And notice what they do. Who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Now, did you catch the we and the us? I guess Luke's back. And he's there. For, was he a part of the ship? I don't know. But he's there along with them. And we see the we pronouns again. But they did us honor. They brought us everything we needed for our next leg of the journey. And that seems fitting. It, there's, a, there's a blessing of each other that's going on here. Publius was kind to Paul. And and covered him with his own roof. Paul could, was then kind to Publius's father and covered him with a laying on of hands and healed him. The people catch wind and they come running and Paul blesses and heals them. And in return, they bless and provide for Paul. I'm always amazed at how much mileage God can get out of miracles. And it blesses both parties, both the giver and the receiver, since God cares about them both. And so you had a shipwreck. You've you already tossed out your wheat and the tackling and everything else. How on earth are you going to get to Rome from here? Well, just serve others. And they'll come back and serve you. You literally cast your bread upon the waters. <laughs> well, now it's returning unto you after many days. In fact, it wasn't even so many. Then verse 11. And after three months, and no, Paul is not stalling. 
He's not trying to avoid Rome. He's been trying to get there for years now. But after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. Oh, it wintered in the isle. Yeah, those people were smart enough not to sail <laughs> during the winter. And I guess they had a place that was commodious to winter in, for them at least, their own form of fair havens. And so here, a ship's about to leave. It took three months for the winter to pass. And now Paul, chomping at the bit, is able to move forward. By the way, when it says whose sign was Castor and Pollux, those are the twin half-brothers in Greek and Roman mythology. We usually refer to them as Gemini. But those are the patron gods of sailors, which I think is interesting that this ship, dedicated to the patron god of, of sailors, is now ready to set sail with someone who knows the real patron saint of every sailor and everyone else. It's not Castor. It's not Pollux. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Maybe I can introduce you to him on the way. But as they're going, they landed at Syracuse. And we tarried there three days. And from thence we fetched a compass, or went around, and came to Regium. And after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteoli, where we found brethren. Wow, you found brethren here? I never even heard of this place. I don't even know if I pronounced it right. But this place, there are brethren. There are Christians everywhere. The gospel really is spreading. Well, yeah, you think? <laughs> the stone was cut out of the mountains. It is rolling forth to fill the earth. And there, when we found the brethren, we were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. Oh, you're almost there, Paul. But can you wait a week and rest up and receive some more refreshment from fellow saints? People that believe in you and might be a little surprised that you're planning on going all the way to Rome. I mean, we're pretty close, but we want to stay away from Caesar, if at all possible. It's, it's rough to be Christian here. Paul, doesn't, Paul cannot be moved, so he's moving forward. Sure enough, verse 15, From thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as API Forum and the three taverns. And those are miles and miles from Rome, but we're getting closer and closer. API Forum is kind of one checkpoint. Three taverns is another checkpoint. And everywhere they go, brethren have heard about it, and they come to meet them. Again, saints encouraging, blessing, so excited to have him come. In fact, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. So there we see that Paul is treated differently than other prisoners. And again, that's happened everywhere he's gone. Felix treated him not like any other prisoner, the centurion on the ship kind of let him do his own thing. Now, here in Rome, I mean, yeah, we'll keep a, a token soldier there. Uh, no, no longer needing a 470-man army to protect him. Just one guy to kind of keep watch, but yeah, let him dwell by himself. We won't throw him into a, a prison surrounded by other prisoners. We know this guy doesn't really deserve that. So let him live alone and have a prisoner there. And... Yeah, live alone. He's never alone. You got brethren everywhere. And Paul thanks God for them. It helps him take courage. There's something about the fellowship of saints, or the fellowship of suffering, as Paul will later call it, that just binds you together. And as I've traveled to different places and met saints, I'm always amazed at their goodness whether it's been here in Utah or recently in Idaho or in California or in Alaska or Montana or North Carolina, places I've been recently to share the gospel and try to encourage the saints, I'm always as encouraged by them as they could ever be by me. And it's an amazing thing to see just the goodness of God's people. Whether it's the island of Melita, <laughs> whether it's the saints that live near Puteoli or the three taverns. That'd be a rough place to live if it's known for its taverns. But hey, I'll live the gospel despite it. They're blessing Paul just like he's blessing them. Now, verse 17, it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. 
I want my own people to come and listen to me. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, as he always addressed to them, my own people, my own family of the faith. Now to you men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, there's that collective pronoun, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. I did nothing against the Romans. I've done nothing against the Jews. So you chief of the Jews here in Italy, you brethren, I haven't gone against you or us. It's our fathers I've been holding on to. Okay. Now, when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, Paul tells them. It's the only reason I'm here. There were other people of our people, fellow Jews that spoke against me. And that's why I had to appeal to, to, to Caesar. Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. So I wasn't going against my own people either. You see Paul here trying to stay on the Jews' good side, maintaining his own innocence, as he should. I'm not here because I've done anything wrong in any direction. Not politically against Rome, not religiously against Judaism. Trust me on this. Now verse 20, For this cause therefore have I called for you, to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. You see there again, Paul invoking hope. I am here because of hope. Because I maintain my hope. Because I've seen the fulfillment of all of my hope. In fact, all of our hopes. The hope of Israel. My friends, the Messiah has come. <laughs> oh, fathers. The promises made to the fathers have been fulfilled. The Messiah has come. He was crucified because that was part of the plan. He conquered sin and death thereby, but he has risen from the grave. This is Paul teaching his first discussion as he has done so many times and in so many places before. And how will they react? They said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. So we haven't heard any evil reports about you. So don't worry. You don't have to defend yourself. As far as we know, there's nothing, no defense needed. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So these Jews at least have an open mind. But... Oh, there's some need for disabusing the public mind. Because Christianity is well known. This sect of the Nazarenes, whatever they're, they're called. Christians, is that what you guys go by now? I don't know. Uh, but we know enough about you to, know, to be a little concerned. Because everybody seems to speak not just about you, but against you. So, uh, I'm pulled in one direction by the the reputation that your people hold, but not wanting to prejudice ourselves against you. That's why we came. After all, we haven't heard anything specific. There's no evidence against you that we've heard from anybody, even among our own people. And so, will you speak for yourself? We're curious to know what thou thinkest. And I'm always grateful for people that have an open mind to, to give us an open ear. I've heard some things about Latter-day Saints. But I'd like to know for myself. So let me talk to a Latter-day Saint directly. Christer Stendhal, the great bishop of Stockholm, Sweden, former dean of the Harvard Divinity School, and an amazing scholar of religion and interreligious relations. He said among his three rules for inter, or interfaith dialogue, one of them was, listen to believers, not detractors. If you want to hear about a faith, ask somebody who believes in it. Not someone who never did or once did and no longer does. Okay? And these people are doing that, are paying that respect to Paul. And what is Paul going to say? Verse 23, When they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging. And of course there's going to be many. If the world knows about Christianity, if they're spoken against everywhere, then of course there's going to be a lot of curious onlookers. Wait, wait, we got a Christian here among us? Seriously? Well, we've got to hear what, he's going to, what he has to say. 
And believe me, Paul has plenty to say. <laughs> Here's a summary of it. To whom he expounded and testified. And those are two wonderful verbs. Sometimes we expound without testifying. And sometimes we testify without expounding. We've got to do both. We need to explain what we believe. And then we need to let people know that we do, in fact, believe it. Okay? So he does both. And what does he expound and testify of? First, the kingdom of God. Second, persuading them concerning Jesus. And how does he do it? Both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And how long does he do it? From morning till evening. And how do they react to it? Some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. That's a pretty quick summary of a mission, but it describes it well. Here he is teaching and testifying about the kingdom of God. It's here. It's among us. It's within us. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? The Hebrew Bible keeps telling us, promising us of a, mess a messianic age. And we're still under the Roman thumb. Believe us, we're here in Rome. Oh, no. Jesus came and brought the kingdom with him. I know what you're, what you're thinking. Uh, so many people assume the same thing. Go back and reread John chapter 6 and the bread of life discourse, and I'm not that kind of Messiah, but don't leave me as a result. I'm here to conquer the things that, that no one can overcome. Believe me, the Roman Empire, as mighty and immovable as it seems, will come and go. But the kingdom of Christ is here to stay. He's brought the kingdom, and it's changed everything. Let me tell you more about this Jesus. In fact, more than tell, let me persuade you. And I'll go back to our shared source of authority. Remember in Mars Hill, I'll quote Greek and Roman poets and philosophers. Here among the Jews, even in Rome, it's the Bible that you hold to. And so I hold to it too. And I'm a Pharisee, so I know my stuff. I learned from Gamaliel himself. So sit down and let me tell all of you Apollos's the rest of the story. Because all you've got is part. I want you to rejoice in full. And so he teaches them all of these things. Morning till night, some believe, some don't. And that's the way it's always going to be. I hope they don't decide in advance to be an unbeliever. Even more, I hope we don't decide in advance to leave them in their unbelief. So Paul preaches. Verse 25, we then see where the diverging path will lead the mixed multitude. Remember, some believed, some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, so before you leave, you believers and unbelievers, I just have one last thing to say. What, just one word. And it's going to come from one of the prophets, and you'll know very well of whom I speak. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. So he's quoting Isaiah here. In fact, it's from chapter 6. And this is what the Spirit said to Isaiah. Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, fat that is, so deeply buried underneath this unfeeling layer that God cannot push his hand through to inscribe upon our fleshy tables. No, our heart is grossly fattened, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. I mean, heaven forbid any of those things occur. I certainly wouldn't want to be healed by God, because that means I'm admitting that I had something wrong with me. I certainly don't want to be converted. That means I required a change. So, no, 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 no. While you're crying repentance, please allow me to plug my ears so I don't hear you. And hold up my heart so that you can't penetrate and touch it. Close my eyes so I can't see. Oh, it's blindness that Paul has been battling this entire time. He knows what blindness feels like. 
but he also knows what it's like to see the light of the Lord. I love that Paul is quoting Isaiah 6 here. As a mixed multitude is leaving the house where he's staying, self-selecting, which path will I follow? Will I be one with eyes to see and ears to hear and heart to feel, or will I remain willfully blind and deaf and unfeeling? The choice is theirs, and the choice is ours. Which way will we go? Now, I know I said I'd only give you one more word, and Isaiah 6 had a lot more words than one, but let me just tack on one additional one. Verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. So that's the first thing to know. You Jews that are about to walk away from me one last time. God is turning away from you as well. And the salvation that he promised our fathers and has promised again to us, he's repackaging to send to a Gentile audience. And not just to send it to them, but for them to receive it. Because that's the other thing I know. Be it known that salvation is sent to the Gentiles, but also be it known that they will hear it. They have better eyesight than you do. They can hear more clearly than you. Their hearts are more opened. You circumcised your skin, but they circumcised their hearts. And they are open to be touched by the Spirit of God. They will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Well, at least their reasoning, instead of revolting, which is what how their countrymen always seem to do elsewhere. As soon as they hear some good word about the Gentiles, they're going to push Jesus off the cliff in Nazareth. They're going to tear Paul limb from limb in Jerusalem. Here, we're not immediately flying toward physical violence, but man, you've given us something to think about. We came to ask you what you thought. Well, we left with a lot of food for thought for ourselves. Will I be a believing Jew? Or will I sit back and watch God, the God of Israel, turn toward the Gentiles because I wouldn't turn toward him? Yeah, something to think about. And not just for them, for us all. Is this my chance to, to change? Have I been in the presence of a prophet? Have my eyes been opened? And will I keep them open to be able to follow the way and the truth and the life which is in Christ? I love what Paul is leaving them with. And as they walk away, hmm, Isaiah ringing in their ears, Paul ringing in their ears, hopefully the Spirit ringing in their, in their souls. Men and brethren, what shall I do? A big choice awaits me. As we approach the end of the book of Acts then, verse 30 and 31, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. This is another entire mission I spent two whole years in Puerto Rico, but he spent years on his first mission and years on his second and years on his third and then years stuck in Caesarea and now years stuck in Rome. But this is a missionary under house arrest. And many recent missionaries know exactly what that feels like as you served during COVID and in quarantine and you couldn't go out and tract or knock doors or street contact or visit people in, the, in their homes. Well, did that stop the work of God from progressing? No unhallowed hand can do that, let alone a virus. So what does Paul do in this hired house? Well, he received all that came in unto him. <laughs> I can't come to them, but they can come to me, and they are. Anyone who comes, he receives. And what does he do once they've come? Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he taught. And how did he teach? We should know by now. This is Paul we're talking about. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. Sound like Paul? I would think so. All confidence. Another way to say that is all faith. 
faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he had come to know years ago on the road to Damascus. He'd been on many roads ever since, but it was the road that led him back to Jesus that he was always pursuing. No matter where it took him, he couldn't be moved away from that mission. And he served with all his heart and might and mind and strength until he had nothing left to give. This is where the book of Acts ends, and yet this is not where Paul's story ends. Personally, I'm thrilled that we get to study so many of his words from now on. And what he wrote to the Romans, and what he wrote to the Corinthians, what he wrote to the Galatians, and everyone else. There is deep doctrine. There is powerful theology. What he teaches, I hope, I hope you'll stick with me. Because what we're about to do is change gears and move away from history into theology. We're shifting from the church history to the Doctrine and Covenants in a way. We are going to try really hard the next few months to wrap our head around what, what Paul taught. And he's a genius, so we're going to have to stretch ourselves to try to understand what he's trying to say. But it's worth the effort, believe me. Here, with all confidence, no one forbidding him, because nobody can stop him, he's going to preach and teach and we'll get the chance to be his students from this point forward. There's actually a passage in one of the letters of Timothy that describes what he's doing here in Rome to a T. This is 2 Timothy 2 verse 9. Paul says, Wherein I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. <laughs> this is Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail, but he's writing letters to the saints that end up being canonized scripture themselves. Revelation from the Lord to him and to us all. Joseph was bound, but the word of God was not. Here in Rome, Paul was bound, but the word of God was not. Because you just can't stop it. You can't forbid it. It will go forth nobly, boldly, confidently, right? And independent. And it sounded in our ears leaving us with the choice to make of what we will do about it. Can you picture yourself there in Paul's house in Rome, surrounded by a crowd that's crowded in because they want to hear him too, but somehow the way Paul preaches, it feels like it's just you and he alone in a room. And he's bearing witness. He's expounding, he's testifying, he's teaching of the kingdom, and he's teaching of the king of that kingdom, namely Jesus Christ. He's helping us understand from scripture and from poetry and from life experience, telling stories and teaching doctrine and helping us come to know for ourselves the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that we will accept his message that will stay on board the Good Ship Zion, that will believe in his belief and trust in his trust and have faith in his faith. Paul will go to the grave with those kinds of words on his lips. Though the Bible does not tell us of his eventual martyrdom, tradition explains that he was most likely killed during the anti-Christian persecution of Emperor Nero, somewhere around 62, 63, 64 AD, that he bore witness until his final breath and remained immovable and unshaken throughout it all. Again, as he said to Timothy, from this <laughs> house imprisonment, and as he says to us all, words that hopefully we will be able to echo. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith.